Last week, in the first episode dedicated to adventure movies, that genre, that mysterious genre that has captured generation after generation, is here on this channel again to surprise you, to entice you into watching some of the most marvelous examples ever put on film. In today's episode, the second of this series, we will be talking about The Prisoner of Zenda, released in 1937 and directed by John Cromwell. I'm crowned king. I meet the loveliest, most beautiful woman. That isn't what you used to say. You used to call me toe-headed little scarecrow. No. I hope you slapped me. I did. And once I kicked you quite hard. There. The last detail. Now remember. That is to be released 20 minutes after Hensar brings you word that the coronation ceremonies have been cancelled. You want to hold him? Make him jealous. Well, you have to fall back on me for that. There are mainly three reasons why I wanted to talk today about The Prisoner of Zenda. One, again, because my grandmother loved the movie and she was a big fan of the genre and also of adventure novels but also the other two reasons for me to talk today about the prisoner of zanda are ronald coleman and douglas fairbanks jr Ronald Coleman, I have to admit, that was an actor that, again, my grandmother loved, but that I hadn't quite discovered. I had seen movies like The Talk of the Town, which is a movie that I already commented on in a video dedicated to Jean Arthur, and also way back when I had also seen Lost Horizon. But beyond that, again, I must confess that I was not truly particularly interested in Ronald Coleman's career. But as of lately, I saw consecutively The Prisoner of Zenda, Random Harvest, and also Bojest, the version of 1926 and my point of view changed completely and now I truly must confess that I'm going through a Ronald Coleman face. I deserve it. Ronald Coleman's career was quite long and I'm quite baffled that I overlooked this fantastic English actor. He was quite a rarity amongst performers that made the transition from silent films to sound features. He was paired with Hungarian actress Vilma Banki, with whom they made a romantic on-screen pairing that was contemporary to Greta Garbo and John Gilbert and also very successful. But I should say with the beginning of the use of sound in movies, his amazing, fantastic voice was an asset for him. So there's a lot to love and admire about Ronald Coleman. Talking about the novel, as many of you would know, the movie was based on the book by Anthony Hope of the same title, published in 1894. It is a story that takes place in the fictional European country of Ruritania, and I would say it is also a story of duplicity, obviously, but of juxtaposition and confronted themes too. We find, on one hand, soon to be King Rudolf the fifth of Ruritania and also a distant English cousin, Rudolf Rassendil. Ronald Coleman plays both parts in terms of personality are very different. The future king of Ruritania is a very dissolute, irresponsible man. On the other hand, Rassendil, a polite, dutiful and respectable man. On the eve of King Rudolf's coronation though, his half-brother Michael, played in the movie by Raymond Massey, has him drugged. When his devoted friends Colonel Zapt and Fritz von Tarlenheim, played by C. Aubrey Smith and David Niven respectively, they turned to English Rassendil to impersonate the future king so that he and not his half-brother Michael can secure the throne. After some understandable hesitation, Rassendil finally accepts, but in the meantime, the authentic King Rudolf V is abducted and imprisoned in a castle in the small town of Zenda with the help of 
dashing yet villainous Rupert of Hansau, played as you probably have guessed it by charming Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Also in the mix we find Princess Flavia who is the king's bride-to-be played in 1937's version by Madeleine Carroll and also fantastic actress Mary Astor as the mistress of Massey's half-brother Michael and that's the premise or the starting point of the story if you have never seen any adaptation or read the novel I must say that it is one of the most exciting examples of adventure fiction not only is the use of two characters who look a lot alike such as the prince and the pauper or the man in the iron mask. In the prisoner of Zenda we find the perennial struggle of good versus evil but also of personal interest versus a noble duty or loyalty versus treason. These are the kind of juxtapositions and confronted themes that I was alluding to and that help create the necessary conflict and also convey the message of the story. Much like the case of Beaugest, which was the movie that we talked about last week, The Prisoner of Zenda has seen numerous adaptations and in fact this movie released in 1937 was the fourth. There are three silent versions dating back to 1913, 1915 and the most famous released in 1922 mainly because it starred actor Louis Stone, actress Alice Terry and Ramon Novarro. There was even a fifth version released in 1952 also quite famous starring Stewart Granger, Deborah Carr, James Mason and Jane Greer. In 1979 there was another comical version starring Peter Sellers. I must say that out of all the adaptations in my opinion which is I know not entirely objective 1937's version is the most entertaining, well crafted, the most perfectly cast and the best. Ronald Coleman yet again is in my opinion perfectly cast in the dual role of King Rudolf V and Rudolf Rassendil. Although he doesn't really juggle both parts during the entire movie, it's nevertheless a fantastic feat. Also superbly cast are actors like C. Aubrey Smith. He was always the perfect English gentleman and David Neven who at this stage of his career was on the verge of getting leading parts instead of just supporting roles such as the one he plays in The Prisoner of Zenda. However, hold the phone, the real deal breaker here of this fantastic movie is Douglas Fairbank Jr. The villainous yet dashing role of Han Zhao fits him like a glove. One gets to wonder why Hollywood or himself didn't put him in more movies with characters like this one. I think Douglas Fairbanks Jr. would have been fantastic but again I don't think Hollywood or himself really got to explore that and it is a shame because he is absolutely terrific in this movie. Sexy, dashing and he absolutely steals even though we have Ronald Coleman who is outstanding but Douglas Fairbanks owns and he steals from everyone else. I read that initially he campaigned to get the dual parts that Ronald Coleman got to play but he was instead asked to play the part of Rupert. Initially too he refused thinking it was not a leading part and it was in fact his father Douglas Fairbanks who convinced him to accept the role and who told him that it was a blessing in disguise and boy he was absolutely right. Continuing with the perfect casting of this movie we have Raymond Massey who is always a fantastic antagonist although in this case as I say his villainous role is slightly overshadowed by Fairbanks Jr. and also as I said before in my opinion Mary Astor is brilliant once again. The way Mary Astor no matter the role she plays or the nature of her part how she can convey humanity, vulnerability, mystery is something that always fascinates me. Finally Madeleine Carroll is also pretty effective even though the part is not again as interesting as the others in my opinion and I think I prefer Deborah Carr playing this part in 1952's version. So talking about The Prisoner of Zenda, I must talk about the work 
the amazing work of cinematographer James Wong Howe. His outstanding genius, really, is what makes The Prisoner of Zenda work, not only because he's able to make possible for viewers to see Ronald Coleman interacting with himself, but because he truly impacted the artistry of photography in movie making. And that is something that you can really see and get to appreciate in a movie like The Prisoner of Zenda. He collaborated in many movies, different genres, but he always, always, he adapted the photography of the movie in service of the story and what the director wanted to convey. And I must say once again that in The Prisoner of Zenda, his work is terrific. Right to the last part of the movie, which is quite impressive and exciting. James Wong Howe started in silent movies and he, much like Ronald Coleman, successfully transitioned into sound features, but not without obstacles and racism. He had to face many challenges within the industry, but he will be always remembered and applauded because of his highly influential and long career that despite all odds, extended up to the 1970s. His amazing work, as I was saying before, can be seen and appreciated also in movies so different from one another other, such as The Thin Man, Yankee Doodle Dandy, Objective Burma, Pursued, The Rose Tattoo for which he won his first Oscar, Sweet Smell of Success, Hud for which he won his second Oscar, Seconds and Funny Lady released in 1975 which was his last. And once again, I know that in my videos I tend to comment a lot on the cinematographers but if there is one name that you will remember out of the videos that I've published and talked about, James Wong Howe is the one. The director of this movie, as I said in the beginning, was John Cromwell, who was the father of actor James Cromwell, whom we mentioned for the video dedicated to LA Confidential. And in The Prisoner of Zenda, I must say that there were some uncredited reshoots by Woody Van Dyke because the studio, David O. Selznick in this case, was not too convinced with the action sequences that Cromwell got to shoot. Music was yet again by Alfred Newman, whom we mentioned also last week for Bojest and art direction was by Lyle Wheeler. He was known as the Dean of Hollywood art directors and his work was prominent in movies like Rebecca, Laura, Leave Her to Heaven or personal favorites such as Journey to the Center of the Earth. So as you can see quite an amazing group of people that got to participate and contribute to this movie that truly made this version released in 1937 stand out. The movie is exciting, is captivating, especially as I said the scenes in which we get to see Douglas Fairbanks Jr also the last part involving a duel. I won't say much but this movie is a thrill from the first second to the last. My only criticism is that they didn't in fact make a sequel for Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Alright so that was all for today's video. I hope that by now you're pretty convinced on Ronald Coleman and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. being two powerful reasons to give 1937's The Prisoner of Zenda a go if you haven't already. As always, I would love to know your opinions if you have watched it. And by all means, if you also love Ronald Coleman and or Douglas Fairbanks Jr., feel free to fangirl in this channel. And as always, thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, take care, and see you all very soon for another adventure video. Bye!